Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is normally the Westport Museum's Tuesday Treasure Program, but this evening we are doing a collaborative uh, history event. We are going to go through some of the lesser seen objects in all of our museum partners collections and explore a little bit more about the um, eerie objects that we all have. My name is Nicole Carpenter. I'm the Director of Programs and Education at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. We do, as always during these programs, uh, offer this for free, but we do, of course, uh, suggest a donation to whichever or all of the organizations that are a part of tonight's program, if you can. We understand this is still a very difficult time. And another way that you can support any of our institutions is by following us on our social media handles. On screen, you can see all of our websites and where you can donate. And any of those pages will also tell you where you can follow any of these organizations. If at any point in the program tonight, you have a question, a comment, or an anecdote that you would like to add to the conversation, we suggest that you go to the Fairfield Museum's Facebook or YouTube pages and enter it into the comment boxes there. That will funnel all into our program and I or one of my other panelists will to, uh, tonight will go through those comments and questions at the end of our presentation. At this point, I wanna turn it over to our panelists who are going to introduce themselves before we jump into our objects for this evening. I am uh, Nick Foster. I am the Associate Curator at the Wilton Historical Society. Hi, I'm Diane Lee. I'm the Collections Manager at the Fairfield Museum and History Center. And I'm Samantha Kulish Fargione, and I'm the Executive Director at the Weston Historical Society. Tonight, I think we are going to begin with Fairfield and Diane, who are going to show a, a silk morning picture. So take it away, Diane. Okay, so today we've got a uh, painted silk morning or memorial picture, uh, circa 1815. And this was done by Sarah Turney of Fairfield. She was born in uh, 1799 or 1801. I've got some conflicting dates for her, but right around the turn of the century. Uh, it's a view of mourners in a cemetery. And this may seem more like a Halloween kind of decoration than something you would have on your wall as uh, more decorative art in your living room. Um, it's what's part of what's commonly known as schoolgirl works. Uh, girls of a certain age, usually in their early teens, around the early 19th century, uh, would go to female academies where they were taught traditional female accomplishments like paintings uh, and needlework. Um, this is more common between like 1800 and 1820. Um, this one's painted on silk. It's a very common design. Uh, there are many similar designs also done in needlework with similar elements of mourners standing around um, some monuments, usually in a very lush green environment, possibly a little village off in the distance. Um, and it's very possible that she attended the Litchfield Academy up in Litchfield, Connecticut to do this piece. There are about uh, at least six other pieces that are traced back to Litchfield uh, that are very similar in composition to this. Um, as I said, it's usually in a, uh, the composition is usually in a rural landscape with the weeping willows, and it also includes the um, people that you can see in the um, composition as well, usually representing members of the family. So you would see, um, I think she's up at the top in, yep, <laughs> she's up at the top leaning against very sorrowfully one of the monuments there. And uh, the next one, she is, uh, you see other members of the family. Um, in the center are what are probably her parents, and uh, the other two sides are probably uh, her four brothers. Um, I can only also find three brothers that survived in, the, um, in her genealogy as well, but we're still tracking that down. Uh, you'll see on the monuments, 
are inscriptions of the family members that are on there. There are uh, three grandparents noted on here, and also one of the younger brothers who only lived to about age one with a lovely, very um, like inscription about uh, no, the, no more the ruse, rose can bloom upon thy cheek, nor playful smiles thy parents' hearts, and I can't read the last word, sadly, um, but very sad, very romanticized. Uh, this is pre-Victorian era mourning, but many of those same elements of people wearing black and a lot of symbolism um, are used and to help cultivate the memory of the dead and also uh, recognizing, memorializing the departed family members. Uh, this is another piece from the collection that is uh, actually a needlework, and it's hard to see. It's very velvet, very dark, but this is more of a needlework, but again, with those same elements, mourning by the monument, the weeping willow. Um, after around 1820, um, mourning pieces and family records kind of turned more to printed items. There were still some uh, needleworks and paintings done, but it was more uh, a family register and a record of the day versus something as morbid as watching people stand around in a cemetery. That's all I have for her. Thank you, Diane. Uh, we are going to go over to Samantha at the Western Historical Society now. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, if we could bring on the screen uh, the, uh, the item I'm going to be showing you today. Um, so we'll wait. To, there, there it is. So this object was donated back in 2014 by the Messix family. Uh, the last owner of the object was Louise Messix, who lived at 138 Old Reading Road here in Weston, Connecticut. Now, even though this object might look like a bouquet or an arrangement of dried flowers, it is actually a bouquet of human hair woven to look and resemble flowers. Um, most likely, this hair would have been clipped from deceased members of Louise Messick's family. Now, I wanna show you the object in person on the camera. So let me just pick it up over here. So hopefully you can see that on camera. As you can see, the object is on a very beautiful wooden base and it has this glass dome over it. So, you know, this shows you right here that uh, this was a very important object to the family. So let me just remove the glass dome so we can take a closer look at the actual item and at the details. So owning a piece of art created out of human hair from deceased people might sound a bit odd and a bit creepy to us today. Um, however, hair art such as this was very popular in the Victorian era, so the mid to late 1800s. Families would save locks of hair from deceased family members, as well as living family members. Um, during the Civil War, sorry, I'm just gonna put the glass top back on and put the object down. During the Civil War, uh, before soldiers went off to war, families, uh, the soldiers would cut a lock of his hair and give it to family members. If family members moved across the country or across the world, uh, usually a lock of hair was kept. Um, so these, but mostly these uh, beautiful pieces of hair art uh, were used as a way to memorialize, honor, and remember family members who have passed on. Now, um, my question was, when I saw this, was did families actually display these items or did they sort of hide them in the, uh, the back closets so no one could see them? But that wasn't the case. Uh, this object that I just showed you definitely was on display and we have proof of that. So um, this is a photograph 
of either the interior of Louise Messick's childhood home, which eventually became her home as an adult at 138 Old Reading Road, or it's the interior of Louise's grandmother's home, uh, which was right down the street at 124 Old Reading Road. So we're not sure which interior this shows. However, it was the interior of a family member. Now, this photo was taken around 1915. The little girl that you see in the photo is Louise Messix. At the time, she would have been known as Louise Etchinger. And the woman sitting um, is Louise's grandmother, Ida Patchen Lyon. Now, if you look closely above, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do this, I'm doing it backwards, um, right over here on the mantelpiece, you will notice the domed um, object I just showed you. So this is proof that the, uh, the hair bouquet was on display in Louise's home or the home of her grandmother in a very prominent room. Uh, most likely this was the living room of the home. So we do have proof that uh, this object uh, was a, a very honored uh, family treasure. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat and uh, I'll answer them at the end. Thank you so much, Sam. That's fascinating. And I think we have another piece very similar to that that we will take a look at uh, this evening in just a moment. Uh, the item that I wanted to speak to you all about um, this evening is also from the Civil War era. Uh, during the Civil War, there was a demand for embalming services. This is when many of the deceased uh, soldiers would need some way of preservation on their way home for their funeral services. And this really brought the process of embalming um, to popularity and really as a necessary process. It was at this point that uh, the Embalmer Supply Company, or ESCO, was founded. This is in 1886, so just about 20 years after the Civil War. The company was established by Carl Bruno Dolge and also Mark, uh, sorry, excuse me, Max Hunky, who are both German-born inventors and uh, inventors. They created their company to serve this demand, and they produced not only embalming equipment, but also embalming chemicals. It's interesting that they're both German-born, and it makes sense for their business, knowing that Germany was the main producer of embalming equipment prior to the 1890s. ESCO also operated under the name the Brooklyn Embalming Fluid Company, and simply as Dolge and Hunky in Brooklyn. In 1890, the business actually moves to Westport, Connecticut, where it has a factory along the Saugatuck River. And just three years later, the partnership was dissolved with Dolge taking over the company and taking on the name of ESCO, or the Embalmer Supply Company. The fluids that they made, and they actually produced this fluid heater to make these fluids uh, easier to use, Many of these fluids contained arsenic, which wasn't banned until the early 1900s. Uh, we have formaldehyde bottles in our collection as well that show advertisements of arsenic-free formaldehyde after about 1905. In 1889, Dolge also set up the first permanent school of embalming called the United States College of Embalming. And today they operate out of Old Line. They're no longer in Westport, unfortunately but they are strictly a chemical firm, uh, growing that side of their business and lessening their equipment sales. Now, the piece that I wanna show you, I just wanna show you a couple of the pieces. So this is the object. Uh, it is silver plated. It is from roughly 1905. Um, it was patented in 1901. Um, and it was, again, it was used to heat disinfectant or embalming fluid for easier use in the process. Uh, down on the lower half of the object here, kerosene or alcohol would have been placed and it would have actually uh, burned and heated the metal element there before tubes were attached to the side here. 
and that would have been uh, attached to the chemicals and then also to the body that was being prepared for burial. And this is probably one of the uh, earliest pieces of equipment that ESCO produced. And it's also one of the first fluid heaters that would have been produced in the United States. Uh, previously, it would have been German made. So that is our small piece of, kind of eerie history that we wanted to present to you tonight from the Westport Museum. And now I think we are going to go over to our, our last guest, um, Nick Foster from Wilton. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, I have, I also have a piece of hair art similar to, uh, to Samantha's, um, but it's a, a little bit on a larger scale. And I think there's a few more uh, hair donors um, involved in this. So what I have is a hair wreath. Um, as Samantha said, hair art and hair jewelry and hair wreaths were quite common during the Victorian period. Um, they were a, a common way of um, the mourning process, which during the Victorian period was, um, rather complex compared to what we would expect today. In some cases, mourning periods would last anywhere from six months to over two years. And Queen Victoria famously mourned her, her husband, Albert, for her entire life. Um, so the hair wreath was, was sort of one of these ways of celebrating the lives of people of your family. Um, they, were, they were not, while we may think of them creepy as creepy now, they weren't particularly um, creepy for Victorians, um, partly because um, death was so much hit closer to home, quite literally, during the Victorian period. Um, it, frequently, people would pass away within the home because they were sick, they didn't have quite the access to hospitals that we do today, or so hospice care. Um, and certain funerals themselves would take place in the, the home itself, in what was the room then called the parlor, um, and now that we call the living room, um, hopefully to sort of distance itself and funeral parlors have now become own independent businesses. Um, but having, you know, the, the passed away corpse of a family member in your home was um, not uncommon. So to have their hair um, was even more common um, in many cases. So um, these hair wreaths would be a, um, essentially a, a craft project for the, the women of the household to, to put these together um, from the hair of both, um, both the deceased as well as the living. And it served as sort of um, essentially as a family tree. Um, and you can see here, and I think we have an image we can pull up that has actually the names of all the people from these families um, that donated their hair. They're a little hard to make out on the screen. They're written very small, um, but it, essentially it's a family tree and it doesn't quite track who's, um, you know, who's related to who, but it does show that there was quite a few people who had their hair um, donated either during their life um, or after they were deceased um, to become this uh, memento. Now, hair wreaths would always have this shape, the, um, sort of a U shape. Um, if we can go back to my camera for one second. Um, essentially this U shape, because it would be, oh, the wreath would be opened up to, to heaven. Um, it was very much in keeping with the, uh, the Christian tradition of, of uh, the majority of the population of, of certainly of Connecticut at the time and sort of the expected um, sort of Christian beliefs. Um, now, the memento, as Samantha said, would be prominently displayed. Um, this was before um, sort of in the infant days of photography. Um, so having a physical memento like this would be a, a great um, symbolic reminder of the person. Um, Later, as photography does get a little bit more advanced, we start to see post-mortem photos, um, which is where they actually would uh, take a photo of the deceased person sort of as a, a family album, um, in the same way you would take a family photo today, but with the deceased person at the, the forefront. So really taking this idea of memento to its sort of uh, logical extreme, or at least for them. Um, this particular wreath uh, was actually has four different uh, family names, intertwined families that were related. Um, this included the Randall, Clark, Willard, and Ogden family uh, of Wilton. Ogden um, would be a very recognizable name for uh, members of, for those of us watching in Wilton. Um, they're a very prominent late 18th century, or late 19th century, early 20th century family. Um, so, it's interesting to see that the way that these mourning ideas and certainly the hair wreath really spreads. Um, it wasn't just for, you know, 
the, the wealthy, even in a small farming community like Wilton, um, you see these, these hair wreath ideas and some of these morning ideas really taking root um, and before they're phased out in the early 20th century. But uh, that is our, our Wilton hair wreath um, and a great example of uh, hair art. So. Thank you so much, Nick. Those are fabulous. Uh, at this point, we are um, happy to take any questions that anyone has. If you have any anecdotes or comments um, for uh, our guests or myself, we are more than happy to, um, to address those if you have any. So we do have one here. Let me see if I can make this bigger. There we are. Uh, why did they always choose hair? Did families save anything else from people uh, who have died? That might be uh, a question more for uh, maybe one of our hair wreath panelists. So that is an excellent question. One of the reasons I know that hair um, is used is because it doesn't really degrade and it keeps its color. Um, it's, I mean, this, this wreath itself is well over a hundred years old. Um, and if you can see that the, uh, the hair color itself um, is still quite vibrant and it, and it sort of keeps. So it's a, it's a, a weird thing to say, but hair is sort of a rugged material that would, you know, that would last as um, something to display for a while. Um, and it was sort of an easy thing to, to work with as a craft. Um, there were other objects that people would keep, obviously clothing, sort of things like that. But hair was a very simple thing to, to take from someone um, an easy thing to craft into, into something like this. I think you covered it, Nick. And also, as you mentioned earlier, Nick, um, photos, once photography had come around, was something that people really cherished. You, uh, cherished. you think of lockets um, and pieces of jewelry. Not only would they put hair in something like that, a lock of hair, but also uh, small photographs and things once that uh, process had come along. Mm -hmm. Actually, going back to the uh, post-mortem photography, there's an excellent archive in New York City called the Burns Archive, and uh, you can Google it. Uh, I believe they have some of their photographs on their website, uh, but they have one of the largest collections of post-mortem photography uh, in I'm going to say maybe the world, um, and uh, it's it's actually extremely interesting and and sort of jarring when you see these images of um, family members and the deceased. They they look as if they are still living, and really the only telling signs is the fact of you know their their fingers uh, where the fingernails uh, have changed and. So I would recommend if you're if you're ever interested in in post mortem photography to check out the Burns Archive B U R N S Archive because um, they have a really good collection of that. We have another question: uh, Were women traditionally permitted to attend funerals? I don't know if I have a good a good answer for that. If anyone else has a, um, a comment about that one, I'd love to hear I, your thoughts. I'm no, I'm I'm not an expert in in this. I know that um, funerals, in some sense, were sort of there were industries built around funerals, at least in the later part of the 19th century. Um, there was famously actually a railroad built from London out to a cemetery outside of London that was sort of as the London cemeteries got crowded, they built a railroad purely to get people in mass from London out to the, what was then the suburbs of London. Um, and it would be hundreds of people. Um, so I would assume that women were a part of that. Now, I, you know, I don't know what traditions changed over the years, um, but my understanding is that you would try to get pretty much as many family members as possible to these funerals, particularly during the Victorian period. But I'm I could, I'm not the expert, so if someone wants to correct me, I'm more than happy to be corrected. I honestly don't, I don't know the answer to that question. So that, that's, a good, uh, that's a good one to research for sure. I mean, we know that uh, many, many of, of the family members are a part of these funerals, especially as they're happening in the home um, in the early 20th century and the late 19th. Um, 
obviously the the family would be involved, but I'm not sure how much women in particular were involved in that process. It's an interesting question. As we find out more information, we'll have to get back to you. We have a, I see we have another question here about how uh, one of the common questions curators get is how do you preserve um, hair pieces in a museum? Well, not necessarily hair pieces specific question, but, uh, but how do you preserve objects and, and hair pieces in particular? Um, I don't know, if Samantha, if you wanna, I've been talking about hair a lot. Do you wanna hop in? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, um, the most important thing is to make sure that it's kept in a climate controlled environment. Um, and, I, and I know that's important for all collections, uh, but climate controlled um, and we also keep it covered. So, you know, it's not uncovered or say for Nick taken out of the frame. Um, it is, it's covered up with the dome, climate controlled in an acid free uh, container. So that's how that's how we're we're preserving ours. I don't know if if Nick, you're you you guys are doing anything different. Yep, climate controlled, making sure the the uh, the temperature is the correct temperature. It's usually somewhere around 68, uh, 70 degrees, somewhere in there. And varying collections have different temperatures. Um, but trying to keep humidity down, all sorts of. There's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo I could go into, and I don't want to bore anybody. But um, Essentially, it's trying to keep it away from from other materials that would uh, degrade it in some way, and just making sure that the temperature and humidity is right. What about you, Diane? Is there anything special for the the silk piece? Uh, well, the, sp the silk piece is very similar to the other pieces as far as keeping it covered, more so than the hair. Keep it out of the light uh, because the silk will fade; it will degrade some of the material. Um, I'm unsure what this piece is painted with. Uh, a lot of them tend to be more of like a watercolor paint, that kind of thing. So you want to watch out for fading in the watercolor. Um, this piece was conserved a number of years ago. So it was conserved with a lot of um, uh, good conservation materials and uh, things that are not acidic and will keep it stable and will keep the fabric stable over the years. And uh, currently we keep this one boxed. It is flat and boxed, so it is not hanging up on our racks in um, in light. And when if we were to display it, it would be up for short amounts of time, uh, so it's not exposed to too much light. And what Nick and Samantha were saying about the hair, most of the pieces that I've ever run across um, have been under some sort of glass or in some sort of glass to include um, jewelry and things like that that are in lockets or in rings. Um, there are many, many locks of hair that are found in family papers as well. Um, I've worked with many an archivist who I can hear a screech from the other side of the office because they found yet another big lock of hair falling out of a piece of paper. Um, and they will usually do what they can to keep that together and put it in a bag and just kind of keep it in one um, place rather than leave it hanging out with the paper so the paper doesn't get degraded by anything that's on the hair. Our piece is a little bit different in the preservation that we do just because it's, it, it won't fade, luckily. Um, so the light is not um, as much of an issue with this piece, but we do have to worry, um, always have to worry about humidity with it being a, a metal piece. And we also have, um, because of the chemicals that were used on this, there is actually some corrosion on the outside of the piece overall. So we do have to um, be conscious when we take in items like this that none of those chemicals are still present in the object. Um, this obviously had formaldehyde in it at one point, so we, we have concerns about chemicals with this piece, um, but as many pieces in our collection, um, it is conserved to make sure that it's safe, not only to display, but also safe for our staff to be able to show. And, handle. and we also use our gloves as usual. I know that we had a, another question here uh, do you have any creepy museum hauntings or scary stories to share while working in historic houses? Well, um, I'm actually currently sitting in a, a 1760s era or 1750s era house um, that 
creaks like you would not believe. Um, so and it, I have not experienced, I don't think I've ever experienced anything that I can't, that I literally couldn't explain, but the amount of creaking and we also have several mannequins up on the second floor, um, which out of the corner of your eye seem to move as car headlights pass through the window. Um, so I actually, I'm sitting here alone in, in the museum and I'm actually, now that I'm talking about this, kind of want to leave because I'm waiting for one of those mannequins to pop out of the, the corner. So that's particularly creepy. A couple of years ago, I know that uh, this is before I started working at the museum, we had a team of uh, paranormal investigators come in and they claimed that they did find uh, the presence of a man and the presence of some children. Um, of course, we know that there have been people who have passed in the house. Um, my director swears that she has seen a gentleman um, and very frequently our, our staff speaks to any spirits that might be here just to let them know that we're the ones coming in and turning on lights and things like that. And sometimes lights are still on when we swear that we've turned them off. So whether it's it's staff members fibbing about turning the lights on or ghosts, I, I don't know. But. There are some, a lot of creeks, a lot of creeks. I've never experienced anything in Weston so far. <laughs> Maybe I'll get lucky one of these days. How about you, Diane? The building was built in 2007, so yeah, not so much. We do have a uh, 1790 tavern that we, uh, take care of uh, in the grounds as well. And um, I personally have never had anything over there. I've heard tell of some people who have had weird feelings and swear that there's something there, but I've not actually witnessed anything other than what Nick says, like the, the weird creaks every once in a while that kind of make you look around, but that's about it. Yeah. We actually, um, speaking of owning buildings, we have, um, the oldest house that's still standing in Wilton is from 1726, and it's one of our buildings. And it famously had a murder take place on the front porch in 1897. Um, and so I have not been in that building after dark, but my suspicion is that if there was anything creepy going on in any of the buildings that we have, it would be that one. For sure. Yes. So <laughs> I avoid, I only go there during daylight. I haven't had any experiences related to this, but the front room of the Bradley Wheeler house used to be a dentist office. So I know that it was probably a very scary place for living people at one point, um, but we haven't had any dentistry related um, hauntings that I know of. So. I think that's all of the questions that we have this evening. If you have any more, please do comment on, on our videos. Uh, my staff and I do monitor our Tuesday Treasure videos. If you have any questions in the future, we will do our very best to get back to you. I want to thank all of our guests this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for bringing your items. They were fantastic. Is this the part where we say thank you for having us? Maybe, maybe. Okay, sorry, there was, there was a, a nice stage pause there. So thank you for, on behalf of the Wilson Historical Society, thank you for having us. Thanks for have, uh, bringing in the Western Historical Society. We appreciate it. And Fairfield too, thanks, Nicole. You're very welcome, no pressure, no pressure. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us and thank all of you for joining our program this evening. And we hope you enjoyed taking a look at some of the unusual items in our community. Have a great evening, everyone.